Hi guys, Mosh here. Today we're going to talk about the basics of data structures and algorithms, which is one of the topics that comes up in coding interviews all the time. In fact, more and more companies ask questions about data structures and algorithms to see if you can think like a programmer. In this video, we're going to talk about the basics of data structures and algorithms. We'll be talking about big O notation, arrays, and linked lists. After watching this video, if you want to learn more, I encourage you to enroll in my Ultimate Data Structures and Algorithms course. The link is below this video. Now, to watch this video, you don't need any prior knowledge of data structures and algorithms, but you need to know the basics of programming. In this video, I'll be using Java, but if you don't know Java, that's perfectly fine. You can code in your favorite programming language. If you enjoyed this tutorial, please support me by liking and sharing it with others. Also, be sure to subscribe as I regularly upload new videos. All right, now let's jump in and get started. Before we talk about data structures and algorithms, we need to talk about the big O notation. We use the big O notation to describe the performance of an algorithm. A lot of people find big O scary, but don't worry, I'm gonna make it super simple for you. So let's jump in and get started. So what is this big O all about? Well, let's start with the classic definition on Wikipedia. Big O notation is a mathematical notation that describes the limiting behavior of a function when the argument tends towards a particular value or infinity. Huh? That's the reason why a lot of people find big O scary. But as you will see in this section, the underlying concepts are actually not that hard. We use big O to describe the performance of an algorithm. And this helps us determine if a given algorithm is scalable or not, which basically means, is this algorithm going to scale well as the input grows really large so just because your code executes quickly on your computer doesn't mean it's going to perform well when you give it a large data set. So that's why we use the big O notation to describe the performance of an algorithm. Now, what does this have to do with data structures? Well, as you will learn in this course, certain operations can be more or less costly depending on what data structure we use. For example, accessing an array element by its index is super fast, but arrays have a fixed length and if you want to constantly add or remove items from them, they have to get resized. And this will get costly as the size of our input grows very large. So if that's what we need to do, then we have to use another data structure called a linked list. These data structures can grow or shrink very quickly, but accessing a linked list element by its index is slow. So that's why you need to learn about the big O notation first, before we can talk about various data structures. Also, big companies like Google, Microsoft, and Amazon always ask you about big O. They wanna know if you really understand how scalable an algorithm is. And finally, knowing big O will make you a better developer or software engineer. So over the next few videos, we're gonna look at various code snippets and use the big O notation to describe the performance of our algorithms. Here's our first example. This method takes an array of integers and prints the first item on the console. It doesn't matter how big the array is, we can have an array with one or one million items. All you're doing here is printing the first item. So this method has a single operation and takes a constant amount of time to run. We don't care about the exact execution time in milliseconds because that can be different from one machine to another or even on the same machine. All we care about is that this method runs in constant time and we represent it using the big O of one. This is the runtime complexity of this method. So in this example, the size of our input doesn't matter. This method will always run in constant time or big O of one. Now, what if we duplicate this line? Here we have two operations. Both these operations run in constant time. So the runtime complexity of this method is big O of two. Now, when talking about the runtime complexity, we don't really care about the number of operations. We just wanna know how much an algorithm slows down as the input grows larger. So in this example, whether we have one or one million items, our method runs in constant time. So we can simplify this by writing down O of one, meaning constant time. Let's look at another example next. Here we have a slightly more complex example. We have a loop. So we're iterating over 
all the items in this array and printing each item on the console. This is where the size of the input matters. If you have a single item in this array, you're gonna have one print operation. If you have a million items, obviously, we're gonna have a million print operations. So the cost of this algorithm grows linearly and in direct correlation to the size of the input. So we represent the runtime complexity of this method using the big O of N, where N represents the size of the input. So as N grows, the cost of this algorithm also grows linearly. Now, it doesn't matter what kind of loop we use to iterate over this array. Here we're using a traditional for loop. We could also use a for each loop. For example, for int number in numbers, we could simply print the number. We're still iterating over all the items in this array. We could also use a while loop or a do while loop. Now, what if we have a print statement before and after our loop? What do you think is the runtime complexity of this method? Well, you saw that this single operation is running constant time. So here we have the big O of one. Our loop runs in big O of n. And once again, we have the big O of one. So the runtime complexity of this method is O of one plus n plus one, which we can simplify to O of two plus n. However, when using the big O notation, we drop these constants because they don't really matter. Here's the reason. If our array has 1 million inputs, adding two extra operations doesn't really have a significant impact on the cost of our algorithm. The cost of our algorithm still increases linearly. So we can simplify this by dropping this constant. What matters is that the cost of this algorithm increases linearly and in direct proportion to the size of our input. If you have five items in the input, we're gonna have five operations. If you have a million items, we're gonna have a million operations. Now, what if we had two loops here? So let me delete these print statements and duplicate this loop. What do you think is the runtime complexity of this method? It's gonna be big O of N plus N or big O of two N. This is another example where we drop the constant because all we need here is an approximation of the cost of this algorithm relative to its input size. So n or 2n still represents a linear growth. Now, what if this method had two parameters, an array of numbers and an array of names? So first we iterate over the array of numbers and then we iterate over the array of names, like this. What do you think is the runtime complexity here? Well. Both these loops run in O of N. But here's the tricky part. What is N in this case? We are not dealing with one input. We have two inputs, numbers and names. So we need to distinguish between these two inputs. We could use N for the size of the first input and M for the size of the second input. So the runtime complexity of this method is gonna be O of N plus M. And once again, we can simplify this to O of N because the runtime of this method increases linearly. In the last video, you learned that simple loops run in linear time or O of N. But here we have nested loops. This is the algorithm that we use for printing all combinations of items in an array. So what is the runtime complexity here? Well, let's find out. In our outer loop, we're iterating over our input array. So here we have O of n. Now, in each iteration, once again, we're iterating over all the items in this array, another example of O of n. So the runtime complexity of this method is O of n times n or n squared. We say this algorithm runs in quadratic time. As you can see in this diagram, algorithms that run in O of n squared get slower than algorithms that run in O of n. Of course, this depends on the size of the input. If you're dealing with an array of, let's say, 50 items, we're not going to see any differences. But as our input grows larger and larger, algorithms that run in O of n squared get slower and slower. Now, what if you had another loop before or after this loop? For example, let's add a for loop and once again, iterate over all the items in this array and print them on a console. What is the runtime complexity of this method? 
Well, here we have O of N. So the runtime complexity of this method is going to be O of N plus N squared. Now, once again, we can simplify this. The square of this number is always greater than the number itself, right? So in this expression, N squared always grows faster than N. Again, we use the big O notation to understand how much the cost of an algorithm increases. All we need is an approximation, not an exact value. So here we can drop N and conclude that this method runs in O of N squared. Let's look at another example. What if instead of this loop, we had another nested loop here? So four int of third in numbers, there you go. The runtime complexity is now O of N cubed. As you can imagine, this algorithm gets far slower than an algorithm with O of N squared. Another growth rate we're gonna talk about is the logarithmic growth, which we show with the big O of log N. Here's the logarithmic curve. Now, compare this with the linear curve. As you can see, the linear curve grows at the same rate, but the logarithmic curve slows down at some point. So an algorithm that runs in logarithmic time is more efficient and more scalable than an algorithm that runs in linear or quadratic time. Let's see a real example of this. Let's say we have an array of sorted numbers from one to 10, and we wanna find the number 10. One way to find the 10 is to iterate over this array using a for loop, going forward until we find the 10. This is called the linear search because it runs in linear time. In the worst case scenario, if the number we're looking for is at the end of our array, we have to inspect every cell in this array to find the target number. The more items we have, the longer this operation is gonna take. So the runtime of this algorithm increases linearly and in direct proportion with the size of our array, right? Now, we have another searching algorithm called binary search, and this algorithm runs in logarithmic time. It's much faster than the linear search. Assuming that our array is sorted, we start off by looking at the middle item. Is this item smaller or greater than the value we're looking for? It's smaller, so our target number, in this case 10, must be in the right partition of this array, right? So we don't need to inspect any of the items in the left partition. And with this, we can narrow down our search by half. Now, in the right partition, again, we look at the middle item. Is it smaller or greater than the target value? It's smaller, so again, we ignore the items on the left and focus on the items on the right. So in every step, we're essentially narrowing down our search by half. With this algorithm, if we have 1 million items in our array, we can find the target item with a maximum of 19 comparisons. We don't have to inspect every item in our array. This is logarithmic time in action. We have logarithmic growth in algorithms where we reduce our work by half in every step. You're going to see this a lot in the second part of this series where we talk about trees and graphs. Unfortunately, I cannot show you an example of this in code now because it's a bit too complex. There are a few things we have to talk about before you're ready to see that in code. But trust me, you'll see that in the code in the future and it will become super easy. For now, all I want you to take away is that an algorithm with logarithmic time is more scalable than one with linear time. The last growth rate we're gonna talk about in this section is the exponential growth, which is the opposite of the logarithmic growth. So the logarithmic curve slows down as the input size grows, but the exponential curve grows faster and faster. Obviously an algorithm that runs in exponential time is not scalable at all. It will become very slow very soon. Again, I cannot show you an example of this in code yet. We'll have to look at it in the future. For now, all you need to understand is that the exponential growth is the opposite of the logarithmic growth. And by the way, these growth rates we have talked about so far are not the only growth rates, but these are the ones that you see most of the time. There are some variations of these that we'll look at in the future. For now, just remember these five curves. You have seen how we can use the big O notation to describe the runtime complexity of our algorithms. In an ideal world, we want our algorithms to be super fast and scalable and take minimum amount of memory. But unfortunately, that hardly if ever happens. It's like asking for a Ferrari for $10. It just doesn't happen. Most of the time, we have to do a trade-off between saving time and saving space. There are times where we have more space, 
So we can use that to optimize an algorithm and make it faster and more scalable. But there are also times where we have limited space, like when we build an app for a small mobile device. In these situations, we have to optimize for the space because scalability is not a big factor. Only one user is going to use our application at that moment, not a million users. So we need a way to talk about how much space an algorithm requires. And that's where we use the big O notation again. Let's look at a few examples. Here we have this greet method that takes an array of strings and prints a high message for every name in this array. Now in this method, we're declaring a loop variable, and this is independent of the size of the input. So whether our input array has 10 or 1 million items, this method will only allocate some additional memory for this loop variable. So it takes O of one space. Now, what if we declare a string array like this? We call it copy and initialize it like this. So the length of this array is equal to the length of our input array. So if our input array has a thousand items, this array will also have a thousand items. What is the space complexity of this method? It's O of N. The more items we have in our input array, the more space our method is going to take. And this is in direct proportion to the size of our input array. That's why we have O of N here. And by the way, when we talk about space complexity, we only look at the additional space that we should allocate relative to the size of the input. We always have the input of size N, so we don't count it. We just analyze how much extra space we need to allocate for this algorithm. So that's all about space complexity. In this course, we'll only focus on runtime complexity because that's a bit more tricky. But from now on, think about the space complexity of your algorithms, especially in situations where you have limited space. See if there are ways to preserve the memory. Hey guys, Mosh here. I wanted to let you know that this video is actually part of my Ultimate Data Structures and Algorithms course. The complete course is 13 hours long and I've divided it into three parts so you can take and complete each part easily. If you're serious about learning data structures and algorithms, I highly encourage you to take this course and learn all the essential data structures and algorithms from scratch. It's much easier and faster than jumping from one tutorial to another. We'll be talking about various types of data structures, such as linked lists, stacks, queues, hash tables, binary trees, AVL trees, heaps, tries, graphs, and various types of sorting, searching, and string manipulation algorithms. The course is packed with almost 100 interview questions. These are the interview questions that get asked at companies like Google, Microsoft, and Amazon. You can watch the course online or offline, anytime, anywhere, as many times as you want, and you would also get a certificate of completion and a 30-day money-back guarantee. It's exactly like this tutorial, it just has more content. If you're interested, click on the link below this video to enroll in the course. Thank you and have a great day. In this section, we're going to talk about our very first data structure, and one that you're probably familiar with, arrays. Arrays are built into most programming languages, and we use them to store a list of items sequentially. In this section, first, we're going to look at various strengths and weaknesses of arrays. Then I'm going to show you how to use arrays in Java. And finally, we're going to build an array class from scratch. This is a fantastic exercise for you to get your hands dirty in the code and get prepared for more complex data structures. So do not skip this section, even if you know arrays well. So let's jump in and get started. Arrays are the simplest data structures and we use them to store a list of items, like a list of strings, numbers, objects, and literally anything. These items get stored sequentially in memory. For example, if we allocate an array of five integers, these integers get stored in memory like this. Let's say the address of the first item in memory is 100. As you probably know, integers in Java take four bytes of memory. So the second item would be stored at the memory location 104. The third item would be stored at the memory location 108 and so on. For this very reason, looking up items in an array by their index is super fast. We give our array an index and it will figure out where exactly in memory it should access. Now, what do you think is the runtime complexity of this operation? It's O of one, because the calculation of the memory address is very simple. It doesn't involve any loops or complex logic. So if you need to store a list of items and access them by their index, arrays are the optimal data structures for you. Now let's look at the limitations or weaknesses of arrays. 
In Java and many other languages, arrays are static, which means when we allocate them, we should specify their size, and this size cannot change later on. So we need to know ahead of time how many items we want to store in an array. Now, what if we don't know? We have to make a guess. If our guess is too large, we'll waste memory because we'll have cells that are never filled. If our guess is too small, our array gets filled quickly. Then, to add another item, we'll have to resize the array, which means we should allocate a larger array and then copy all the items in the old array into the new array. This operation can be costly. Can you guess the runtime complexity of this operation? Pause the video and think about it for a second. Here's the answer. Let's say our array has five items. Now we want to add the sixth item. We have to allocate a new array and copy all these five items into that new array. So the runtime complexity of this operation is O of N, which means the cost of copying these items into the new array increases linearly and in direct proportion to the size of the array. Now let's talk about removing an item. Here we have a couple of different scenarios. If you want to remove the last item, that's pretty easy. We can quickly look it up by its index and clear the memory. So here we have O of 1, which is our best case scenario. But when doing big O analysis, we should think about the worst case scenario. What is the worst case scenario here? This is when we want to remove an item from the beginning of the array. We have to shift all the items on the right one step to the left to fill in the hole. The more items we have, the more this shifting operation is going to cost. So for the worst case scenario, deletion is an O of N operation. So because arrays have a fixed size, in situations where we don't know ahead of time how many items we want to store in them, or when we need to add or remove a lot of items from them, they don't perform well. In those cases, we use linked lists, which we're going to talk about later in the course. Now let's see a quick demo of arrays in Java. In this video, we're going to look at arrays in Java. If you know arrays well, feel free to skip this video. So to declare an array, we start with the type of the array. Let's say we want to declare an array of integers. So we type int, and then we add square brackets to indicate that this is an array and not just a regular integer. Next, we give our variable a name, like numbers. And here we use the new operator to allocate memory for this array. Here we repeat the type of the array one more time. But this time, inside the square brackets, we specify the size of this array. Let's say 3. Now let's print this on the console. We get this weird string. What is this? Well, this is a combination of the type of the array, followed by an at sign, and then this value that is generated based on the address of this object in memory. That is not useful. You want to see the content of this array. To do that, we're going to use the arrays class. Let me show you. So here, instead of printing numbers, we're going to use the arrays class. We type arrays. As you can see, this class is declared in this package, java.util. So we press enter, and IntelliJ imports this class on the top. Now we use the dot operator and call the toString method. We pass our array here, and this method will convert it to a string, and then we'll print that string on the console. Now, let's run the program one more time. There you go. Much, much better. So as you can see, all items in a numeric array are initialized to zero. Now let me show you how to change the value of these items. So after we declare our array, let's say we want to set the first item. We type numbers. Once again, we use square brackets. And here we specify an index. The index of the first item is zero. So here we are referring or referencing the first item. We set this to, let's say, 10. Similarly, we can set the second item to 20 and the third item to 30. Now let's run the program one more time. So here's the content of our array. Beautiful. Now, if you know the items that you're going to store in your array ahead of time, there is a shorter and cleaner way to initialize your array. Instead of doing all this ceremony, we can use curly braces to declare and initialize this array. So here we type 10, 20, and 30. And this will allocate an array of three items in memory, and it will initialize each item according to the values we have passed here. Take a look. We get the exact same result as before. Now, these array objects have a field called length, and this returns the size of the array. Let's print this on the console and see what we get. So, print 
numbers.length. There you go. The size of this array is three and we cannot change it. So if you want to store four items here, we have to create another array, copy all the existing items, and then add the fourth item. This is the problem with arrays in Java. So if you want to work with lists that grow or shrink automatically, you'll have to use linked lists. We're going to talk about them in the next section. But before we get there, I'm going to give you a fantastic exercise. We'll look at that next. So as you learn, arrays in Java are static, which means they have a fixed size and this size cannot be changed. But now we're going to do something really cool. I've created this array class, which is like a dynamic array. As we add new items to it, it will automatically grow. And as we remove items, it will automatically shrink. Let me show you how that works. So we create a new array object. We call it numbers and then initialize it like this. Here we pass the initial size, let's say three. Now this numbers object has a method for adding new items. Let's add 10 and then 20 and then 30. We also have a method for printing this array. Now technically this print method shouldn't be here because an array should not be concerned about printing its content on the console. It shouldn't know anything about console. It should only be concerned about storing these values. Displaying these values is a completely different concern and should not be implemented as part of this class. But in this course, we want to keep things simple. That's why I've implemented the print method inside the array class. Now let's run this program and see what we get. So 10, 20, 30, beautiful. So the initial size of our array is three, but we can easily add a new item and our array is going to automatically grow. No problem. We also have a method for removing items. That is remove at, which gets an index. Let's say we want to remove the last item. What is the index of this item? Well, the index of the first item is zero, then one, two, three. So let's remove the last item. Here is the result, beautiful. We also have one method for finding the index of an item. Let me show you. So I'm gonna do a print statement here and call numbers.index of. This will return the index of the first occurrence of this item, let's say 10. So because 10 is the first item in this array, this method is gonna return zero. Take a look, zero. If we pass a number that doesn't exist in the array, let's say 100, it's gonna return negative one, okay? Now here's your exercise. I want you to build an array class that works exactly like what you saw in this video. This is a fantastic exercise for you to get your hands dirty in the code, especially for working with data structures and algorithms. Don't say, oh, Mosh, this is too easy. I already know how to do this. Trust me, as we talk about more complex data structures, our code is going to get more complex. So I want you to treat this as a warm up exercise. So pause the video and spend 20 minutes on this exercise. When you're done, come back, see my solution. All right, we're going to solve this problem step by step. And this is the approach I want you to follow whenever you want to solve a complex problem. Don't try to do too many things at once. Try to break down that problem into a smaller, easier to understand, easier to solve problems. So in this video, we just want to focus on creating this array class and printing its content on the console. You're not going to worry about adding new items or removing existing items. We're going to implement these features in the following videos. So let's add a new class here. We're going to right click this package and add a new Java class. We call it array. Now in this class, first we need to add a constructor. So we type public array. Here we need a parameter to specify the initial size of the array. So int length. Now inside this class, we're going to store our items in a regular Java array. So we're going to declare a private field private int array called items. Now here in the constructor, we need to initialize this array based on the initial size. So we set items to new int array of length. Pretty straightforward. Now let's implement the print method. So public void print. Here we need to iterate over all the items in this array and print them on the console. Pretty easy. So for into i, we set it to zero. 
as long as i is less than items dot length we increment i and in each iteration we simply print items of i so in each iteration we get one item from the array and print it on the terminal now let's go back to our main class we're going to create a new array object we call it numbers and set it to a new array of three now let's print this object on the console so we get these three zeros but technically we shouldn't see anything because we haven't inserted any items in this array so let's go back to our array class we need another field to keep track of the number of items in this array we cannot rely on items that length because this is the memory we are allocating initially we might allocate memory for 50 items but we might only insert two items in this array so every time we insert a new item we need to keep track of the number of items in this array how can we do that we can declare another private field private int let's call it count now back to our print method we're going to replace items that length with count so initially count is zero and this loop is not going to get executed in the future every time we insert a new item in this array we're going to increment count by one so now let's run this program one more time because our array is empty we don't see anything beautiful we have completed the first step so next let's implement the insert method all right now let's implement the insert method so public void insert we give it a parameter int item now what should we do in this method there are a couple of things we need to do if the array is full we need to resize it and also we need to add this new item the new item at the end of the current array let's not worry about the first step yet instead we're going to do the second step which is easier so we want to add this new item at the end of this array how can we do this well we use the items field we use square brackets now we need to pass an index what is this index this index should represent the last item in this array it's not going to be items that length it's going to be count so currently we don't have any items in this array so the index of the last item or the place where we should insert the new item is index zero next time we add a new item the index is going to be one and then two and three so we set items of count to this new item and then we increment count by one or we can simplify this code get rid of this line and increment count over here so with this expression first we set items of count to item and then count is going to be incremented by one let's test our code up to this point so back to the main class we're going to call the insert method and pass a couple of numbers 10 and 20 now let's run the program there you go beautiful so let's go back to the array class and implement this scenario how can we tell if the array is full that's very easy we can write an expression like this if items dot length equals count now in this case what should we do first we need to create a new array that is larger let's say twice the size then we need to copy all the existing items into this new array and finally we're going to set the items field to this new array because currently the array that the items field is referencing is full so let's implement each step first we need to create a new array this is pretty easy we declare an int array let's call it new items and set it to a new int array of count times two so this new array is twice the size of the old array now we need to copy all the existing items here we're going to use a for loop exactly like the for loop we have here so we need to iterate over all the existing items and reference them using their index so for int i we set it to zero as long as i is less than count we increment it after each step now in each step we're going to set new items 
of i to items of i. That is pretty straightforward. Finally, we need to set the items field to this new array. So we set items to new items. Now let's test this. So back to the main class, I'm going to add a couple more items and run the program. Look, now we have a dynamic array that automatically grows as we add new items to it. So now that you understand how everything works, I'm going to go back to the array class and get rid of these additional comments. We don't need these comments because our code is clean and straightforward. We don't need to repeat it. We should only use comments for explaining why's and how's, not what the code is doing. That should be reflected in the code itself. So delete, delete, and delete. Next, we're going to implement the delete operation. All right, now let's implement the remove method. So public void remove at. We give it an index. Now, what should we do here? First, we want to validate the index and make sure it's within the right range. For example, if someone passes negative one, it doesn't make sense. What does it mean to remove the item at index negative one? Or let's say our array has five items. As you know, the index of the last item in this case should be four. What if someone says remove the item at the index five or six or seven? Again, it doesn't make sense. So first we want to validate the index. Second, we want to shift the items to the left to fill the hole. We'll talk about what this means in a second. Let's implement each of these scenarios one by one. So first we're going to validate the index. This is pretty easy. We can write an if statement like this. If index is less than zero, or we use two vertical bars to indicate a logical or. Or index is greater than or equal to count. What does this mean? Well, if count is four, that means the index of the last item is three. So we cannot tell this array to remove the item at index four or five and so on. So that is why we have greater than or equal to count here. Now, what should we do in this case? We don't want to print a message on the console because this class might be used in an application with a graphical user interface. There, we don't have a console. So instead, we should throw an exception because this is a programming error if someone passes an index that is out of range. So by throwing an exception, we force the program to crash. And with this, the programmer knows that they made a mistake and they will solve this problem. So we throw a new exception of type illegal argument exception. That was the first step. Now let's work on the second part. Let's imagine we have an array like this, 10, 20, 30, and 40. And then we want to remove the item at index one. That is this 20 over here. So in order to remove 20, we should copy 30 over here and then 40 over here. So we're shifting each item one step to the left. In other words, the item at index one should be set to what we have at index two. And what we have at index two should be set to what we have at index three. How can we implement this? This is very easy. We need a for loop that starts from this index and it goes all the way until it reaches the end of this array. So for int i, we set this to index. As long as i is less than count, we increment i after each step. Now in each iteration, we want to set the item at this index to the item to its right side. That is pretty easy. So we set items of i to items of i plus one. Okay. So after we execute this for loop, our array is going to look like this. 30 is going to be copied over here. And then 40 is going to be copied over here. But we still have four items in this array. We want to shrink this array so it looks like this. How can we do that? Very easy. After our loop, we decrement count by one. Because count represents the total number of items currently in the array, not the size of the array, right? So let's test our code. Back to the main class. We added four items here. 
Before printing the array, let's call remove at and remove the first item. So 10 is going to go away. Now we have 20, 30, 40. Beautiful. Let's test it with a different index. Let's say index 1. Now 20 is gone. Beautiful. Let's do another test and remove the last item. So you pass index 3. 40 is gone. What if you pass index 4? We got an exception of type illegal argument exception. This is a programming mistake. We don't want to print a message on the console. We want to stop the execution of the program. So now that we're done with the implementation of the remove method, let's get rid of these unnecessary comments and make our code clean. Next, we're going to implement the search operation. Finally, let's implement the search operation. So public int, because we want to return the index of the given item, we call this method index of and give it a parameter item. Now, what should we do here? We want to loop over all the items in this array. If we find the item, we want to return the index. Otherwise, we're going to return negative one. So once again, we're going to use a for loop. That's pretty easy. For i, we set this to zero. As long as i is less than count, we're going to increment it by one. Now we need to get the item at the given index and compare it with this item. So we write an if statement. If items of i equals this item, then we want to return i as the index. Otherwise, if we finish this loop and we're still here, we didn't return from this method, that means we couldn't find this item. So we should return negative 1. Let's test our new method. Back to the main class. We added these four items, 10, 20, 30, 40. Let's print numbers.index of 10. So that is 0. Beautiful. What about the index of a number that we don't have? Let's say 100. That is negative 1. So we're done with this implementation. But before I remove the comment, let me ask you a question. What is the runtime complexity of this method? Pause the video and think about it for a second. OK, here's the answer. We need to analyze the best case and the worst case scenario. The best case scenario is where this item is the first item in this array. So in that case, the runtime complexity is O of 1. But the worst case scenario is where this item is at the end of the array. So we have to loop over the entire array to find that item. If our array has 1 million items, that means we're going to have 1 million comparison operations. So in the worst case scenario, the runtime complexity of this method is O of n. As I told you before, when doing big O analysis, we always consider the worst case scenario. So the runtime complexity of this method is O of n. So you learn how to build a dynamic array from scratch. And that was a great exercise. However, Java has two implementations of dynamic arrays. Let me show you. We have two classes, vector and array list. Both these classes are declared in the java.util package, but they're slightly different. The vector class will grow by 100% of its size every time it gets full, whereas the array list will only grow by 50% of its size. Also, all the methods in the vector class are synchronized. This is an advanced topic, and I'm going to cover that in my upcoming advanced Java course. But basically, when we say a method is synchronized, that means only a single thread can access that method. In other words, if you have a multi-threaded application where multiple threads are going to work with this collection, then you're not going to be able to use the vector class. You should use the ArrayList class because the methods of the ArrayList are not synchronized. Again, I'm going to cover that in detail in my upcoming advanced Java course. Now let's have a quick tour of the ArrayList class. So let's type ArrayList. Now these angle brackets you see here, these represent a generic parameter. With this generic parameter, we specify the type of each element in this ArrayList. For example, if you want to have an ArrayList of integers, we type integer. This integer class is a wrapper around the native or primitive int type. So for every primitive type that we have, like int, 
short, byte, boolean, whatever. We have a wrapper class. For example, we have short, we have byte, we have boolean, and so on. We can also have an array list of strings or students, assuming that we have a student class. In this demo, I'm going to create an array list of integers. So integer, enter. Now we need to import the ArrayList class because it's declared in a different package. So we press Alt and Enter. There you go, it's imported on the top. Now let's create our ArrayList. We call this list and initialize it using the new operator like this, new ArrayList. And now we can call the add method. We can add a number here and duplicate this line a few times, add two more numbers. Now we can print this list on the console. So here's the content of our array, beautiful. We can also remove items, so remove. We can remove a particular object or remove an item at a given index. For example, we can remove the first item and now 10 is gone, we only have 20 and 30. We can also find the index of the first occurrence of an element, so we call list that index of 20, because now after removing the first item, 20 is going to be the first item, this method will return zero. We also have last index of, which will return the index of the last occurrence of an item. We also have contains, which returns a Boolean value telling us if we have this item in our array or not. And finally, we can use the size method to get the number of items in this array. And finally, another useful method is the toArray method. This will convert this list to a regular array object. So there are times that we want to work with a regular array object. Let's say you have a method that only accepts an array and you cannot pass an array list class there. In that case, you can easily convert your array list to a regular array. Linked lists are probably the most commonly used data structures after arrays. They solve many of the problems with arrays and are also used in building more complex data structures. So in this section, we're going to look at linked lists. We'll talk about how they're structured in memory. We'll look at the time complexity of various operations on them. And finally, we're going to build a linked list from scratch. Again, this is an incredible exercise for you to train your programming brain. So let's jump in and get started. We use linked lists to store a list of objects in sequence. But unlike arrays, linked lists can grow and shrink automatically. As you can see here, a linked list consists of a group of nodes in sequence. Each node holds two pieces of data. One is a value, and the other is the address of the next node in the list. So we say each node points to or references the next node. That's why we refer to these structures as linked lists, because these nodes are linked together. We call the first node the head and the last node the tail. Now let's look at the time complexity of various operations. Let's say we want to find out if our list contains a given number. We have to traverse the list starting from the head all the way to the tail. What is the runtime complexity here? It's O of N because the value that we are looking for may be stored in the last node. That is our worst case scenario, right? What about looking up by index? Well, unlike arrays where items are stored sequentially, the nodes of a linked list can be all over the place in memory. They may not be exactly next to each other. That's why each node needs to keep a reference to the next node. For this reason, unlike arrays, we cannot quickly look up an item by its index. We have to traverse the list until we find that item. In the worst case scenario, that item can be at the end of the list. So once again, here we have O of N. What about insertions? Well, it depends where we want to insert an item. If we want to insert a new item at the end, we simply need to create a new node and have the last node or the tail point to it. We should have a reference to the last node somewhere so we don't have to traverse the list every time. Now we need to have the tail reference this new node. So inserting a new item at the end is an O of one operation. What about inserting at the beginning? What do you think is the runtime complexity here? Pause the video and think about it. Here's the answer. It's an O of 1 because, again, we should have a reference to the head or the first node. So to insert a new item at the beginning of the list, we create a new node, link it to the first node, and then change the head to point to this new node. Again, this is very fast. 
Unlike arrays, we don't have to copy or shift items around. We simply update the links or references. Now, what if you want to insert an item somewhere in the middle? Let's say after the 10th note. Well, first we have to find that note. That's an O of N operation. And then we have to update the links, which is an O of 1 operation. So inserting an item in the middle is an O of N operation. Now let's talk about deletions. I want you to pause the video and think about three scenarios. Deleting an item from the beginning, from the end, and from the middle. Draw on a piece of paper how the links should be updated. Also calculate the runtime complexity for each scenario. This is very important. Make sure to do this little exercise because later on, you're going to code all of this. If you don't understand these concepts, you're not going to be able to code them. So pause the video, do the exercise. When you're done, come back, continue watching. All right, here are the answers. Deleting the first item is super fast. We simply set the head to point to the second node. That's an O of one operation. Now we should also remove the link from the previous head so it doesn't reference the second node anymore. Why? Because if we don't do this, Java's garbage collector thinks this object is still used, so it won't remove it from the memory. That's why we should unlink this object from the second object. What about deleting the last item? This one is a bit tricky. We can easily get the tail, but we need to know the previous node so we can have the tail point to that node. How can we do that? We have to traverse the list from the head all the way to the tail. As soon as we get to the node before the last node, we keep a reference to it as the previous node. Then we'll unlink this node from the last node and find and have the tail point to the previous node. So the runtime complexity here is O of N because we have to traverse the list all the way to the end. What about deleting from the middle? Again, we have to traverse the list to find out the node as well as its previous node. We should link the previous node to the node after this node and then remove this link so this object gets removed from memory by Java's garbage collector. Again, here we have an O of N operation. Next, we're going to work with linked lists in Java. In this video, we're going to look at linked lists in Java. So if we type linked list, we can see this class is defined in java.util package. These angle brackets you see here, these are generics. That means we can store any kind of objects in this list. We can store integers, strings, any type of objects. So let's press enter. This class is important on the top. Beautiful. Now let's say we want to store a bunch of integers in this linked list. So we add angle brackets and type integer with capital I because here we're using the integer class that is defined in java.lang package, not the built-in primitive type. So we should always reference a class here. This integer class wraps a primitive integer, okay? Or we could have a linked list of strings, or if we don't specify anything here, we can store any kind of objects in this list. One node can hold an integer, another node can hold a string. So let's create a list. Once again, we have to use the new operator to allocate memory for this object. So new linked list. Now we have a bunch of methods for adding new items. We can add at the beginning or at the end. Let's add 10 at the end and then 20 and 30. Now let's write a print line statement and print this list. There you go. It looks like we have an array, but actually we are dealing with a list. So don't let these square brackets fool you. Okay. Now we can also add an item at the beginning. So we call list that at first, let's add five here. There we go. Now we have five, 10, 20, and 30. We have similar methods for removing items. So we can call list that remove last to remove the last item. We also have remove which takes an index as well as remove first for removing the first item. Another useful method is the contains method. We can use this to see if our list contains the number 10. So let's do a print line statement and move this expression over here. So our list certainly does include the value 10. We have a similar method that is list.index of which will return the index of the first occurrence of this object. So if we pass 10 here, this will return zero because that is our first item. There you go. Another useful method is the size method. So 
Let's print that list that size. This will return the number of items in this list, which is three. Beautiful. And finally, the last useful method I want to cover is list the two array. There are times you want to work with an array, so you can convert a linked list to a regular array. Let's convert it to an array and store it here. Now we can use the arrays class to convert this array to a string and then print it on the console. There you go. So this is how linked lists work in Java. All right, now, just like the previous section, we're going to build a linked list from scratch. This is a great exercise for you to practice all the materials in this course. But before we get started, I want to give you a couple of hints. To do this exercise, you need two classes, a node class like this. Here we have a couple of fields, an integer called value and a node called next. So with this field, we can keep a reference to the next node. We also need a linked list class with these two fields first and last, we could call them head and tail, but to be consistent with the linked list class in Java, I decided to call these first and last. I would recommend you to follow the same names. So as you will see my solution, you don't get confused about these names. You can simply compare your code with mine. And here are the methods I want you to implement in this exercise. At first, at last, delete first, delete last, contains an index of. These are the essential methods that we need in a linked list. So spend 30 to 40 minutes on this exercise. Do not skip this. It's super important because in the next section, we're going to talk about stacks and queues, and we're going to implement them using a linked list. So linked list is one of those essential fundamental data structures that you need to master. All right, enough talking. So grab a coffee and get started. All right, let's start by implementing the at last method. So public void at last, we give it an integer. Now, what should we do here? The first step is to wrap this value, this integer inside a node object. So we create a node object like this. Now, as we can see, we have repeated the name of the class twice, and this is unnecessary. We can use the var keyword and let the Java compiler detect the type of this variable. So because we have new node on the right side, the Java compiler will know that this variable is a node object. All right, now we need to set node.value to this item. However, this field is declared as private, and that's why we cannot access it from outside of this node class. We can come here and create a setter like public void set value, which takes a value. And here we type this.value equals value. But I'm going to show you a better way. I argue that this node class is part of the implementation of the linked list. We don't need to work with this node class directly. So this should not be declared as a public class here that can be accessed anywhere in our program. Earlier, when we worked with the linked list class in Java, did we see a node class? We didn't. We simply called various methods on the linked list, and the linked list took care of everything under the hood. So this node class is something that the linked list class should have internally. It's an implementation detail. So we can remove this setter and move this class inside the linked list. So we can add it here on the top. There you go. Now, because this class is declared inside the linked list, we have access to its private fields. So we don't need a setter. Also, we should change this to private. So nowhere in our program we can access the node class. That's better. Now, another thing we need to improve here is this line. With this implementation, we can have a node that doesn't have a value. This doesn't make sense. Whenever we create a node object, it should always store a value. So we can create a custom constructor for the node class and pass this value there. So here in the node class, we type public node. In this constructor, we add a value and we set this.value to value. Now, we can get rid of line 18 and simply pass the value here. Sorry, I mean the item. So our code is shorter and our node object will always be in a valid state. We're not going to have a node without a value. 
That doesn't make sense. So we have a node. What should we do next? Well, that depends on the state of the linked list. If our linked list is empty, we need to set both the first and last nodes or head and tail to point to this new node. Otherwise, we need to append this node at the end of the list. Let me show you. So here's the first scenario. We should check to see if the list is empty or not. How can we do that? We write an if statement like this. If first equals null, that means we don't have any nodes in this list because as soon as we add a node in this list, first should be initialized. So if first is null, we should set first to this new node. We should also set last to this new node, or we can simplify these two lines and initialize both these variables on the same line. That is better. Now we don't need these ugly curly braces. So let's look at the other scenario where our list has at least one node. So else, in this case, we want to add this node after the last node. So we type last.next equals node. We're linking the last node to this new node. Finally, we should update last to point to this new node because now we have one new node in this list. So we type last equals node. We're done with the implementation of this method. So let's use our new list and see if it's working properly. So back to the main class, I'm going to create a new linked list. We call it list. Now, once again, we can use the var keyword to simplify this code. Here we're going to call list that at last 10 and then 20 and then 30. Now, currently we don't have a method for printing this list. And I realized I forgot to tell you to implement this method. But in this video, I don't want to spend time implementing the print method. Instead, I'm going to show you a different technique. So we add a breakpoint on this line by clicking on this area. Look, now it's red. Now we're going to run this code using the debugger. So on the top, look, run, debug main. Here's the shortcut that's Control and D on Mac. So here we are. All the previous lines are executed, but this line is not. So we can click on this icon that is step over. Now all these lines are executed. So let's inspect our list object and see if it's structured properly. So in this debug window, let me expand this. Good. So here we have this list. Let's look at the first node. So the value is 10. Now next, this is referencing another node. What is this node? Here we have 20. And this is also referencing another node. In this node, we have 30. But next here is set to null because this is the last node in our list. So far, so good. What about our last node? This is pointing to the same object where we have the value 30. Beautiful. So we're done with this step. We'll implement another method next. All right, let's implement the add first method. This is very similar to what we did in the previous video. So public void add first, which takes an item. Now, once again, we need to wrap this item inside a node object. So var node equals new node of item. Now here we have two scenarios. If the list is empty, we need to add the first node. Otherwise, we need to prepend this item to the list. So we check if first is null. Then just like before, we set first and last to this new node. Otherwise, we want this node to point to our first node. So we type node.next equals first. And then we need to set the first node to this new node. So first equals node. We're done with the implementation of this method, but I want to show you a technique for making this code more readable and more maintainable. This is something that Unfortunately, most data structures, books, and courses don't teach you. Most of the code samples I see in these books look disgusting. They look really ugly, like old school, like the code we used to write in 1980s. So how can we improve this code and make it more readable? Well, look at this logic. What is the point of this logic? We're trying to see if this list is empty or not. So we can extract this into a private method and call it is empty. Let me show you. So here we create a private method. It's private because this is implementation detail. We don't want this to be accessible outside of this class. So public 
boolean is empty. Now here we simply return head equals, sorry, first equals null. Now we can improve this code by replacing this logic with a call to this new method. Isn't that cleaner? Let's also modify the add last method is empty. Beautiful. Next, we're going to implement the index of method. All right, now let's implement the index of method. So public int index of this item. What should we do here? We need to traverse this list starting from the beginning all the way to the end. As soon as we find an item with this value, we're going to return the index of that item. But we don't have indexes here. So how are we going to implement that? Well, we can declare a variable index and initially set it to zero. Then as we're traversing this list, we increment this index. So we need another variable. Let's say current, we set this to the first node. Now we need a while loop. As long as current is not null, which means we haven't reached the end of the list, we need to compare the value of the current node with this item. So if current dot value equals this item, we want to return the current index. So we return index. Otherwise, we're going to set current to the next node. So we set current to current dot next. And at the same time, we should also increment index. Now, if we reach the end of the list and we can't find the node with this value, we need to return negative one. All right, now let's test our code. So back to the main class. We added a few items here. Now let's print list.index of 10. So we get zero, beautiful. What about index of 30, the last item? Always look for these edge cases. That is two, perfect. And finally, an item that doesn't exist in the list. So negative one, beautiful. Next, we're going to implement the contains method. The contains method is pretty easy. So public boolean contains item. Now, what should we do here? Once again, we should traverse the list, starting from the beginning all the way to the end. If we find this item, we'll return true. Otherwise, we'll return false. However, we already built this logic in our index of method. So we can reuse this. There is no need to repeat this logic. So we type return index of item does not equal to negative one. So if this expression, if value is to true, that means we have this item in our list. Let's test this. So back to the main class, we're going to call list.contains40. Obviously, we don't have this item. What about 10? We get true. Beautiful. That was very easy. Next, we're going to implement the delete first method. All right, now let's work on removing the first item. So public void remove first. We don't need any parameters here. This one is a bit tricky. Imagine our list looks like this. 10 pointing to 20 pointing to 30. Now we want to remove the first item. So we have this field called first that is currently pointing to 10. We should have this point to the second node and this will bring our list forward. It's going to look like this, right? However, we still have this object, this first node that is referencing the second node. So the garbage collector in Java will not be able to remove this object from the memory. To solve this problem, we need to remove this link. Now, here's the tricky part. If we remove this link, we're not going to be able to set first to point to the second node because the moment we remove this link, we lose track of the second point. So to solve this problem, we need two different references, first and second. Let me show you. So I'm going to bring this back. Let's write some code. So first we declare a variable called second. We set this to first dot next. So second is pointing to 20. Now that we have this, we can go and remove this link without worrying about losing track of the second point because we have this second variable as a backup here. So we go and set 
first.next to null. This will remove this link. And finally, we need to update first and set it to point to the second node. So we set first to second. Let's test this. So back to the main class. After adding these items, let's call list.remove first. Just like before, we're going to run this program using the debugger. So control and D. Look at what we have here in this list. First is pointing to the node that contains 20, and this is pointing to this other node. Beautiful. Now, what if our list is empty and we call the remove first method? Let's see what happens. We got an exception of type null pointer exception. This is a programming error. We shouldn't let this happen. So let's see how the built-in LinkedIn class in Java works, and we'll implement the same behavior in this class. So temporarily, I'm going to create another linked list. This time, we're using the class that is declared in the java.util package. So we're going to create a linked list of strings. We call it x and instantiate it like this. Now we call x.remove first. Let's see what happens. So we got an exception, but look at the type of this exception. No such element exception. This is different from a null pointer exception. This is a deliberate error handling. So we should not be able to remove an item from an empty list. So we're going to go back to our linked list class. And before this logic, we want to add an if statement like this. If this list is empty, look, once again, we're reusing this beautiful method. So if the list is empty, we're going to throw a new no such element exception. This is the proper way to implement this method. Hey, I just wanted to let you know that when I was reviewing my videos, I noticed I made a mistake here. I didn't count for the scenario where our linked list has a single item because this logic would work for a list that has at least two items, first and second. So here we need to add an if statement and check to see if first equals last. That means we have a single item or a single node in this list. In this situation, if you want to remove this item, we should set both these fields to null and then return because we don't want to execute this logic over here. So see, even I make mistakes. So does everybody. It doesn't matter. What matters is that we should always review our code. We should test it with different inputs and think of various edge cases. All right, now let's implement the remove last method. This is the trickiest part, so pay close attention. We're going to declare a new method, public void remove last. So let's imagine our list looks like this. 10 pointing to 20 pointing to 30. And we have this last field that is pointing to this node. Now, to remove the last item, we need to find the previous node. This is the tricky part. So we need to traverse this list starting from the beginning. The moment we get here, we need to keep a reference to this node so we can update last and set it to point to the same node. So let's implement this step by step. First, we want to find the previous node. We start by declaring a variable called current and we set it to the first node. Now, as long as current is not null, we're going to go forward. First, we check to see if current that next equals the last node. If that's the case, we need to break out of this loop. Otherwise, we set current to point to the next node. So at this point, we have the previous node. Now, before going forward, I want to refactor this code and extract this logic into a separate private method because at a first glance, it might not be clear what we're trying to do here. So let's declare a private method that returns a node object. We can call this get previous and give it a node object. So whatever node we give it, it will return the previous node. So let's move this logic over here. Now, instead of working with the last node, you want to work with the node that is passed here. So let's change that. Beautiful. Also, instead of breaking out of this loop, we can simply return the current node. 
What if we traverse the list all the way to the end, but we couldn't find the node before this node? We should return null. Now that we have all this logic in a single place, we can go back to the remove last method and call get previous, give it the last node, and store the result in a variable called previous. So in this case, previous is going to point to this node. What should we do now? Well, currently last is pointing to this node. We should change last and make it point to previous. So this will shrink our list like this. However, there's still this object that is pointing to this other object. We should remove this link so the garbage collector in Java can also remove this last node from the memory. So we set last to previous. This will shrink our list. And then to remove the link, we set last.next to null. Let's test our code up to this point. So back to the main class. After adding these items, let's remove the last item. Now let's start the debugger. There you go. So here's our list. Let's see what we have here. We have first that is referencing this node. This is referencing this other node. And here we don't have anything after. So we successfully removed the last node. Beautiful. Let's also make sure that this last field is referencing the same node. Beautiful. So we're going to stop the debugger. Now we need to think of the edge cases. What if the list is empty? Just like before, we should throw an exception. So I'm going to remove these comments and check to see if the list is empty. We want to throw a new no such element exception. What if our list has only a single item? This logic is not going to work because there is no node before the last node. We only have a single node. So this logic is assuming that our list has at least two nodes. So we need another if statement. If first equals last, that means we have a single node in this list. In this situation, we should set both these fields to null and then return. So this other logic is not executed. So this is how we implement the remove last method. Hey guys, Mosh here. I wanted to let you know that this video is actually part of my ultimate data structures and algorithms course. The complete course is 13 hours long and I've divided it into three parts so you can take and complete each part easily. If you're serious about learning data structures and algorithms, I highly encourage you to take this course and learn all the essential data structures and algorithms from scratch. It's much easier and faster than jumping from one tutorial to another. We'll be talking about various types of data structures, such as linked lists, stacks, queues, hash tables, binary trees, AVL trees, heaps, tries, graphs, and various types of sorting, searching, and string manipulation algorithms. The course is packed with almost 100 interview questions. These are the interview questions that get asked at companies like Google, Microsoft, and Amazon. You can watch the course online or offline, anytime, anywhere, as many times as you want, and you would also get a certificate of completion and a 30-day money-back guarantee. It's exactly like this tutorial, it just has more content. If you're interested, click on the link below this video to enroll in the course. Thank you and have a great day.